Can we talk about some of those fight scenes? Our stunt team is like, they're amazing. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to Reppin. I'm Evelyn, your host. We have a killer guest today. She's cunning. She's ruthless. She's an assassin. Well, I'm talking about her character, Zalan, on the CW's hit, Kung Fu. In real life, my guest is a talented Chinese-Canadian actress who's also appeared in ABC's The Crossing, CW's The 100, and CBC's Street Legal. Today, she'll share the story of her unusual path into entertainment, how she overcame her fears to take a major leap of faith to find her own way, despite what was expected of her. You'll see she's definitely not cunning or ruthless, but she is kick-ass. Today, we're hanging out with Yvonne Chapman. Hey, Yvonne, thanks so much for making time to come on the podcast. How are things up in Canada? I mean, things are great in Canada, but first and foremost, like, thank you for having me on here. I, I love your podcast, and thank you for the space and the time to actually talk about, you know, all this stuff. It's, it's really valuable for, for me and for so many. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy you're here. Congratulations on the series Kung Fu. It's a great show and I'm thrilled to see it on air. For the listeners, can you kind of set up what the premise of Kung Fu is and also introduce your character? Who do you play? How does she fit into the show? So Kung Fu follows Nikki Shen. She's a Chinese American woman who left home on this life changing journey over to China where she comes across the Shaolin Monastery. And there she learns philosophy of life. She learns how to fight with these really amazing, powerful female warriors. And when she returns home, she uses the skills that she learned there to protect her community and to protect the world as a whole from an over looming threat that I, as a villain, <laughs> yeah. helped to instigate. So I play Jalan. Um, she is the big bad of the show. She is a badass assassin. Yeah, she definitely is. And she's so, so much fun to play. There's so many colors about her and her character. But yeah, she, she's the big bad of the show. Like I said, she's so multifaceted. It is fascinating to be able to play her because there's just so much depth. And I really have to thank like the showrunners for giving me that. There was a lot for me to dig into, and I really, really am thrilled to be able to be a part, not only just because of what the show is, but also to have such a well-rounded character. So it features an all-Asian cast, and the show skews to a younger audience. Now, growing up, I didn't see anyone that looked like me on screen or, you know, on magazines or in media or anywhere. So talk about the importance of having a show like this on the air, and also for it to skew to sort of a younger demographics. Can you talk about the importance and the impact the show can have? Yeah, I mean, I for me personally, it's same as you. Like I didn't I didn't have that growing up. I didn't really see myself on screen and I think when you're exposed um at a young age and and not just at a young age but throughout life to a certain idea or set of ideas of people and places and things, that becomes really ingrained in you. And the more that you're exposed to only a particular set of ideas and a certain kind of people, it's harder to break those ideas up and to unlearn that. So it's highly important to have this representation on screen because it really provides a medium for people to learn and unlearn harmful stereotypes against people, but also just to educate and to open and to give them access to people that maybe they don't have in their day-to-day -day life. And there's so much value in that. If we look at this industry in particular for the film and TV industry, but really any industry that asserts itself on innovation and creativity and empathy, a homogenous environment, it just isn't conducive to that. Totally agree. Can you talk about the idea of you can see it, you can be it? My parents were immigrants. When I wanted to be in entertainment, I wasn't sure that there was a place for me or it was something I could do. So can you give people a little bit more of an understanding of the importance of representation and why that matters, especially for the Asian community? Yeah, I'm a huge believer in that. What you see is what you know, period. You know, what you read is what you know. It's what you consume. And we have a lot of power in that. We also have the power to give that back. Growing up for me, 
My parents are also immigrants coming to Canada. My dad was born in Shanghai, grew up in Hong Kong. My mother's Singaporean. My dad, on my dad's side, my grandmother's half French. Oh, wow. Yeah. And going in the lineage back to that is Russian Jewish. And so one of the big important factors that for me and my sister, especially on my dad's side, he really made it a priority for us to be exposed to our whole family on that side. And I was really, really fortunate for that experience of getting to know that side of the family looking at the places and absorbing that culture as well, because I think it really laid the foundation for me to be exposed, one, to just a different kind of people that were blood related to me that didn't look like me also, and who also looked like me, so on both sides. But to be exposed to that really just laid the foundation for my curiosity in people and in places and provided an openness, I think, for for me to accept a lot of different things into my life without judgment. And I think that's the importance of representation, truly, is to be exposed to people who aren't within your inner circles. Like, we have to allow for us to get to know each other. And I've been very fortunate. I have a a really diverse friend group. When growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in, in Calgary, in the the school system that I grew up in, I had classmates of different backgrounds. So I, I had that luckily growing up, not everybody has that. And so the power of the media is to give exposure and access to people that you normally don't. And hate to me, in my opinion, is rooted in misunderstanding and miseducation. Or no education and fear. Exactly. You have such a rich and diverse heritage and background and family. So when you were growing up, Was identification and a sense of belonging something that you struggled with? Because you said some of your family looked like you, some didn't. How did it impact you growing up? I think because my background was so diverse and I was exposed to that growing up, it gave me a confidence knowing that I didn't have to just be one thing. That I didn't have to tie myself to one identifier and say, that's wholly who I am as a person. That's awesome. I mean, I'm Canadian. I'm born and raised in Calgary. So that's very much part of my identity as much as it is for me to say that, you know, a lot of my my family lives in Hong Kong and my French family is Parisian. Like a lot of that is still all within me and that that's okay. And I never questioned that because I saw it. That's awesome. How old were you when you got to this point? Because like, that's really big. It didn't really phase me when people would ask me when I was younger about my last name because my last name is Chapman and that is my maiden name. It's not, you know, something that I got through marriage or anything like that, which a lot of people always I totally assume. thought that was, yeah, I totally <laughs> thought your last name was through marriage, like Chapman. Right? And that's totally fair, fair assessment, yeah. So tell me about your last name. On my dad's side, my, uh, my grandmother on my dad's side, I never knew my biological grandfather. He, they divorced when my dad was really young. I have his family over in Japan, which... It's a whole other story of them, you know, kind of getting in contact, which is really cool. But regardless of that, for all intents and purposes, the man that I knew as my grandfather is my grandfather. And his Chinese name is Ho Chok Man, which in phonetically can sound like Chapman. <laughs> yeah. This is the crazy thing. He passed away when I was really young. So I never had the chance to talk to him about his life. But he was a huge fan of film and TV. He was a film, he, like on the side, he produced films, he owned theaters in Hong Kong, and I didn't know any of this until later in life. But the story is that he was doing a co-production between Hong Kong and the Philippines and Japan uh, for this feature film. And at the Philippines Immigration Center, they looked at his name and they called him Chapman, because that's just how they pronounced it. And he's like, that sounds really good. But (laughs) but more, more so on top of that. I wear that name with so much pride because he also changed it, hearing it, clocking that as sounding more English, knowing that he was going to get more opportunity overseas with an English last name than he was with his Chinese name. And that is not an easy thing to do, to, you know, finesse that and know that you're not going to be fully accepted into the room until you assimilate at that time. And this was in the 50s. Wow, what a what an incredible man. Truly. And the fact that he had that thought uh, also makes me a little sad. Because what does it say about society? Like, I'm not going to get any sort of recognition or even time if I don't 
sound American. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation for another time. Have you had similar experiences with your last name now? Because that was the 50s, right? Definitely. Tell me a little bit about your experiences now with your last name. Apart from the questions and the raised eyebrows of being like, your last name is Chapman. And then, and then again, we go through the questions like, wait, are you married? Are you adopted? Are you this? It's like, no, my last name's Chapman. And I would explain it to them. And it was, it was just like an opportunity to be able to reach out to people and have them understand that. Because a lot of the times people don't even realize that's kind of the, the barriers at that time. And still, even today, I've noticed, especially in my professional life, when I got out of university and going out for interviews, the shock on people's faces when I showed up into the room. Right. I I just was not what they were expecting. And in a way, I kind of loved it (laughs) because it's almost an opportunity to be like, okay, well, here I am. Too bad. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's such a signal and mark of like where we are in, in the world and society and like last names and the ideas and judgments people immediately have just based on your last name. I mean, that places you in a certain position in society. It's just crazy. But I'm really happy to hear that you didn't have the struggles of identity and sort of learning young that you can be more than one thing. But what are some of the other um, values that your parents gave you then that you still rely on today? Yeah, you know, I think my parents really instilled the importance to me of, of hard work and education. I really, I really believe that the majority of the issues that we're seeing now and in the world can be solved with education and that bridging of communication. And that's something that I really, really value growing up and still do. I love school. <laughs> I can't, I couldn't get enough of it. I was one of those, you know what I mean? But like, but I look at that and I'm like, you know, you can learn and unlearn anything that you want. And that's something that I think my parents have really instilled in me growing up. Your path into acting is a little unconventional, so to speak. Yeah. (laughs) I think it's awesome that you started in corporate finance, which I believe is mostly men, mostly white men. You're an Asian American woman in corporate finance. And then, wait for it, you started acting as a stress reliever. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So can you tell me you know, what it was like to be a young Asian American woman in corporate finance, because that is as boys club as you can get. Oh my gosh. Tell me about it. Um, I will (laughs) say, Lord, I will say that (laughs) here we go. The companies I ended up with, the work group that I ended up with were fantastic. I had really great mentors and very supportive networks there. It wasn't until I started the interview process um, coming out of university that I was made so aware of my gender and ethnicity. Okay. Give me an example. Oh God. Okay. So I went into this, oh, even talking about it now just makes my, uh, just makes me so frustrated at the situation, but yeah, I can see that. Okay. So I go into this interview. Okay. I worked in mergers and acquisitions. So it was like that kind of corporate development, uh, group setting and, you know, first we meet with the directors of the group and then that went really well. And they're like, okay, great. We'll bring in the the CEO and you can have a chat with him. I think it might be a good fit. He comes in and he doesn't even ask me anything technical. The first thing that comes out of his mouth, so you're a woman and I'm sure eventually you would love to have kids. This is the first thing that comes out of his mouth? Yes. Yes. It was the first thing that came out of his mouth. And I was, I was taken back because I was like, one, I, none of your business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. when things like that happen to you, you just kind of get frozen. And you're like, okay, things are going through your mind of trying to justify the situation. So you're just, I just was just rolling with the punches at this point. And he says that to me, he's like, well, you know, you can understand why that would be a problem for me because eventually you would have to go on maternity leave. I have to like hire somebody else to take your place for that time. And he's not even asking me anything. He's just telling me this stuff. Then he goes on to say, um, do you have, do you have a spouse? Do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a, you know? And I tell him, yeah, I do. He's like, great. Well, what does he do? And I say, well, he's a, he's a chartered accountant. He's a CPA. Oh, what's his name? And I tell him his name. He starts writing down my spouse's name. Great. Well, maybe I'll call him. Oh my God. (laughs) I, I kid you not. I, 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 there's so many things wrong with that. 
that is horrific. So what did you do? I mean, what an asshole. I know. I know. So how did that, did that affect you at all? Did that shake you at all? How did you navigate that? And what did you, like, how did, what did you walk away with? I mean, it shook me in the moment for sure. Of course. And, you know, going back to what I said, where you feel frozen. Yeah. You, you just, you do, you feel frozen. And now looking back, I, I would hope that I have a different skill set now to be able to address it in the moment that it's happening. Because when I look back on it, I'm like, man, it was a missed opportunity for me just to have a conversation with this guy and be like, look, not okay. Really, really not okay. When it's happening, you can't believe it's happening. True. You know, you were young. And like most things, time and age brings experience and wisdom. But that is a grotesque example and situation. So now that you look back, what have you learned then that you are paying forward now? Well, I mean, looking at situations like that, what I what I was grateful that I did at the end of that, it was a job that was put up by a headhunter and I called the headhunter after and I expressed my concern about this because I said, look, talk about an interview nightmare. This is not something that should be tolerated. And I would hope that you would flag this employer for future people going into you. And that's what I think we need to do is the lesson that I learned of all of this is, you know, sometimes it is easy and I understand it completely when people are like, you know what, I'll pick my battles. It happened to me. I'll just let it go and move on with my life. Sure. But we have to talk about it, at least share our experiences with people because there's far more people going through certain similar, unfortunately, situations Right. that we can all learn from and support each other in. I am just so sorry that you even had to experience that. I mean, it was just an awful experience. Anyone in the room stand up for you or say anything? Nothing. And I looked at the other two guys who were completely respectful in the interview that I had with them just prior. And I could tell the look on their faces was like, oh my God. But it's also his boss. That's the problem. When you have people in positions of power who know that they can get away with it, right? We, we have to let them know they can't get away with it. Exactly. No matter what your title is, right? And regardless of what gender you are. You know what I read recently, and I don't know if you would agree with this, racism, discrimination, inequities of all kinds. It's not just hate and ignorance. It's also apathy that fuels mm. the cycle of this. Because if you turn a blind eye this shit's going to go on. I completely agree. I completely agree with that statement. I had a conversation with someone recently who experienced, again, another horrendous story. So they were up for a promotion and a new management team came in. And this management team, <laughs> they were interviewing for this like higher management position, so, which so many people would have been qualified for of different backgrounds, right? Right. Now, the person that they ended up hiring was a white male. And the reason behind that, and this came from this person's mouth in front of everybody because he had no problem saying it, well, we should go with this guy because he's far more marketable and commercial than the rest. Wow. And nobody said anything. This is exactly what you say, is that apathy. And I don't even know if it's so much apathy, but it definitely comes off that way. Or if it's more just like a protective, you know, I don't want to stir the pot. I don't want to be, you know, that person to say something. And I, again, I understand the fear of that. Right. Especially when it's the boss, the boss's boss right. saying that. Right. But we at least should talk about it in, in safe spaces because that way, who knows, hopefully it'll trickle to him, the guy who did this. Right. And maybe it might make him recognize that his behavior was not okay. But I think that until you hold people accountable and there's a group of people standing together, like strength in numbers, that's the only way that we can sort of begin to make that change. But it does start with each one of us as individuals to be an agent of change. And granted, there are consequences. The stakes are high and everyone has to do what's right for them. But I do think the tables are slowly turning, that everyone is starting to kind of recognize that they can all do something. And I think people are more willing to leverage their position to help others, to take a couple of hits. And I think that's going to build momentum, hopefully. No, I completely agree with you. Yeah. So after those experiences and just going through the corporate finance world as a young Asian American woman, and what did you learn about yourself that made you better? Oh, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, 
it was just entering the work world and being in that setting and knowing that I needed to reach out to other people in order to be successful. You couldn't do this or I couldn't do this in a silo. And that's really, that's really tough for me even till today because I can be really stubborn and I want to figure things out for myself. Sometimes I really still need to do that as a process, but I learned very quickly that the more you build a community, the more you build your tribe, the easier life will be and the more fun it is too. And the more successful you'll be in no matter what it is that you pursue. Right. It was a quick, hard lesson for me starting out because I just found myself like floundering a bit. Right. Both in the finance world and, you know, in the film and TV world when I first started that. And it wasn't until I said, okay, you got to put away your pride and reach out to people and ask for help Yeah, to see if you can navigate through this together as opposed to alone. I think that's a huge lesson. So how did you get from the world of finance and go into entertainment? Because I'll tell you that I doubled in accounting and communications and media, which was completely crazy because they're total opposites. So I ended up taking twice as many classes, but you kind of did a similar thing, but you did the extreme version. (laughs) I mean, you actually went and got a job in polar opposite businesses. Help me make that connection between the jump from finances into entertainment, how it translated. Did it prepare you? I mean, what was that like? Well, Speaking of crazy, I'm sure a lot of people thought I was crazy. <laughs> Definitely leaving, you know, the job that I had and everything and, and just, you know, heading off on a prayer and a dream. My parents were very, very encouraging, of course, to go into a stable career, like a doctor and a lawyer or whatever it may be. And I, again, understandably so. They worked really hard for the life that we had here in Canada. Right. It's not an easy thing. And you just want what's best for your children and for your family. So it was something that was really, really imprinted on me was to go and pursue that. And I wanted to make them proud, you know? So course, yeah. I always convinced myself that um, I couldn't do the other. I, almost in a sense of like, ah, oh, it just wasn't for me. And kind of what you said too, I just couldn't see myself really in that. Like you convinced yourself you couldn't do entertainment. Yeah, because, you know, growing up too, I was... I was a really, really, really shy kid. Me too. Yeah. And I I don't know about you, but like for me, it was like, it was always in the peripheral. It was always in the back of my head. I always had this interest in art. Mm-hmm. And I, I did it kind of on the secret, on the down low. <laughs> you know, like I would, <laughs> I would go and, and join a theater class in school and then say, you know, I have to stay late for extracurricular, but it was a play that I was in. Or I'd be drawing and, and, and painting like nonstop in my room or play acting on my own. It was never something I felt comfortable vocalizing and broadcasting to my parents that this was something I seriously wanted to pursue because one, again, I didn't think that they'd be supportive of it. Second, I wanted them to be proud of me. So I just tried to convince myself it's, it wasn't for me. You said you were really shy, right? Yeah. So when you secretly went and took the drama classes, was that hard for you to even register because of your shyness? I mean, you still have to be out in front doing this, even in a drama class. Totally. This is the really weird thing. I think I'm starting to finally unpack, but in front of a camera on a stage, never felt scared. Huh. That whole shyness for me is just completely dissipated. It was an outlet for me to actually express myself, but at the same time, hide behind a veneer of a character. So it's safe. Yeah. Wow, that, that is really insightful. So that's great that you sort of laid it out like you were able to come to indulge in your creative self because that's who you really are, right? Mm-hmm. And there's obviously expectations from your family. You love them and you don't want to disappoint them. I certainly understand and respect that. Mm-hmm. And you have this great job in finance it's practical, you make money, it's stable. Right. Talk about the actual decision to jump because that is a big jump. You know, I think at the time when I decided to do this, um, it was almost like a perfect storm of things happening. I was working my job. I was doing a course um, called the CFA, the Chartered Financial Analyst Program, which is an incredibly demanding course. So outside of my job, I was studying weekends, um, evenings, you know, 
basically every single day of the week. And I was just getting to a point where I was just really strained. On top of that, professionally and in my personal life, I think at that time, it was a bit of a tumultuous situation with my family. And so I had a bit of a, a falling out with my dad in particular. And it was his opinion that really mattered to me in terms of like making him proud to be in this stable career of, of, of making certain choices that seemed at face value looked really good and convincing myself that's what I wanted as well. And I think when all this came to head, I'm like, man, I just need something for myself. And that's when I took an acting class as a stress reliever. And <laughs> I know <laughs> because I knew, I knew that I loved it from before, but I yeah. hadn't visited in a very long time at this point. And so I took this acting class and I loved it. I just loved it. I loved the people in it. It was just a whole different world of, of art and people that I had not been exposed to in so long. And so when the bug hit me, it hit me, it bit me hard. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And it just got to a point where I'm like, look, I, I really loved what I did in finance. It's not that I didn't like my job or anything like that. It was quite engaged and everything. But it got to a point where it, it felt like I didn't have a choice anymore. That this is something that's been in the back of my head for as long as I can remember that I was just kept on pushing and pushing and pushing away. And it wasn't until I broke ties with the ideas of what my life should be like that I decided to actually pursue this. That's awesome. There was just kind of a breaking point in me where in a good way where something snapped and it's like, well, if you're going to do this, you've got to do it now and stop making excuses, stop feeding into the fear. And <laughs> this is an interesting story because what really did it for me was a seemingly inconsequential conversation with a cab driver. With a cab driver? Yeah. 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 I, this was at that, like at that junction, that crossroads where I was so close to being like, okay, I think I'm going to ask for a leave of absence from my work and just go to Vancouver and just try this out just for a year. Just try something. Because you were doing this in tandem, right? Like you were I was. working. That's a crazy schedule. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened with the cab? So I was going for a bachelorette party and picking up my girlfriend going to <laughs> Vegas, whose stay guy it was. And uh, cab came to pick me up first. She was the second stop. And him and I, wonderful guy, just started talking about life. You know, you, you meet some people and you just click and you're just having a good time talking to them. And he was one of those people. And uh, my girlfriend was late packing her stuff. So we sat in front of her house. Uh, he stopped the meter and we were just chatting and talking about life. And I told him what I was thinking of doing. And he said one thing to me that really just capped it. Because I was, I was telling him that I was so scared. I was so scared of like uprooting my entire life changing yeah. my, you know, like changing careers. I mean, careers. it's polar opposite careers. Very. <laughs> um, and then he, as I'm expressing my fears about this, he stopped and he's like, look, fear, don't think about. But success, you never know. That's all it took. It's just that perception of not thinking about the fear and just following what it is that you want to pursue. And success, maybe, maybe not, but that's not the point of it. When you were in that moment, you're still feeling the pressure. You don't want to let your family down. I'm sure that was hugely and highly on your list. Mm -hmm. How did you process that? And does that lesson still stay with you in all aspects of your life? It still stays with me in all aspects of my life. And I wish I had his card, Aww. but wherever he is, thank you. <laughs> right. Truly. Yeah, like in that moment, I don't know how else to explain it. I do remember the feeling, the feeling of all of a sudden this like curtain being lifted away from my eyes. And like, it just became so clear that of course you can't think about feeling, otherwise you're never going to do anything. It's so easy to give into that fear of the unknown, but life is unknown. Even if you choose a stable career, you still could get fired the next day. You have no idea what's going to happen to the world. Right. Yeah. That's still a really big lesson to take in and to run with it. And you, you really got up and did something about it. Now, some people could say to you, Yvonne, not only was your pathway into the entertainment industry, not a traditional one, but there really isn't a traditional path into entertainment. No. <laughs> but some people could say to you that 
you started kind of later in life. Can you talk about how you you actively went and pursued your dreams and that it's not too late and what the advantages you've had starting at the time that you have started? Yeah, I mean, personally for me, if I had started any earlier, it would have been too soon. You know, I, I take it the other way because for me personally, looking back in hindsight, it's always 2020. Sure. And luckily for me in reflecting on that, I think for myself, I needed to live that other life. You know, I needed to have experience to know what it is that could also be on the other side for me. Because I know that I could do something else and be relatively happy with it. Like I said, I, I d- didn't hate my job. <laughs> it's not that right. story of like, you know, the corporate whatever. But I choose this. I choose this because I love it and I need it in my life. And I don't think I would know that I love and need it unless I had the experience of something else That's awesome. to compare it to. On top of that, it just profoundly helped me in in this profession because not everything is an isolated incident. There's so many experiences in your life. And if I can just throw out a finance term of compound interest, it, that's what it is. You know what I mean? Like you take one thing and it compounds on another thing and it adds to another thing. And so my experiences in finance definitely translated to my life now because we, we work in the entertainment business right? as well. And to not only protect my career, but them also to help with the career of other people, of my friends who are in this business, you've got to understand the business. And that definitely is translated from my, from my professional life previously. I love that. But I will also ask you this. Do you feel like the tougher experiences that you know, you've had, some of which you have shared here, like the guy who interviewed you, the CEO, who was just you know, inappropriate and gross, do you feel like something like that in the finest because you've sort of taken that at a younger age that it gave you a sense of self where you could take and apply now because entertainment as much as I love it it's a it's a tough business yes and it can shake the most secure people so do you feel like your early experiences in corporate finance has made you sort of more resolute in the woman that you are today Absolutely. Absolutely. And you said it so beautifully. That guy and those people who come across in your life who really just try to demean you, never ever give them that power for one group or one person to determine what you think of yourself. And that's really what I came out from this because there's there's always going to be people trying to to mold you in a certain way or tell you how you should be like. And at the end of the day, you just got to step away from that and say, no, 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 I am secure in what I have to offer. And when I, I know the value that I bring, because in a perfect world, you'd hope everything would be a meritocracy, but it's not. Yeah. But absolutely it has. It has shaped me and, and strengthened me in the way that has prepared me for the entertainment industry. Like you said, it is not easy and it can be really critical and you're constantly getting flooded with rejection, which I don't even think is at the end of the day, rejection anymore. It's just the process of how it is. And it could feel that way sometimes. But you just got to remember what your value is and what you bring to the table. And again, surround yourself with people who also value that for you and you to them. Because you need to you need to have that strong tribe to survive. And that's what I learned too in finance as well. I was very lucky. I had really great women mentors. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And I sought that out because... It was so clear to me how little numbers there were of us in the finance industry. And translate that to film and TV, you know, you look at the numbers that recently came out as well. It's the same thing. Let's build each other up. But we've got to start with building yourself up and making sure that, you know, people like that just don't have such a power over you to completely break you down. Yeah, I agree with you. And I couldn't support that more. It's just very difficult to do that because a lot of these people are in a position of power. So where and when did you find this sense of self? Like, how did you get your footing? And what would your advice be to someone who is not there yet? You know, I think one thing that we don't talk about enough in this industry is the mental and emotional work that you have to put in. 
to be okay to have that stamina. Break that down for me. Well, look, when I first started in film and TV, it was it was not easy sailing. I've only had the sound bites of, you know, people being like, oh, you, you came from finance, you went this. I packed up my car, my little Honda Civic, drove to Vancouver from Calgary, which is like an 11 hour drive. And I tell people, yeah, I just, I, I packed my car and I left because that's all the time there is for me to say that. But truly in this 11 hour drive, I sobbed probably half the way. I just, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And that was kind of the first instincts of the mental and emotional game that I had to play with myself to like figure out how I was going to handle this because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And I was super scared. And the second I got there, I was like, okay, it's not as scary as I thought. But then going through the motions and learning about the business and going through that rejection and periods of no additions and all of that stuff, I realized outside of just being able to work as an actor, the value that I got was really changing my mindset into something a lot healthier. Tell me more. Look, there's always going to be barriers, no matter what. Right. There's always going to be people telling you that you can't do it. There's always going to be other things happening outside of your control that you wish you could control, but you're never going to be able to. So you have two options there. You can either let it get to you and stew in the negative, or you can look at it and try to find the opportunity in it. I always see numbers in two different ways. So when you see the representation numbers, they're still not great. Let's be honest about that. The proof is in there. But the way I look at it, I'm like, great, you know what? There's a lot more room to grow, a lot more opportunity to be had. So how are we going to do it? What's the actions that we can all take to get that shit done? That's how I look at it. I love that. I think your whole idea of tribe is so important. Overall, everyone has to come together, you know, step up, be accountable, hold others accountable, and to really build a community, especially women. There's such an opportunity to get rid of this idea of being competitive and instead make it into one that is, you know, more like a sisterhood. Yes. How can people who may not have the platform you do make a difference? You have to empower collaboration over competition. Because when you do that, you're going to change the game, period. Don't do this on your own. This may sound weird, but I really don't feel like there's a sense of competition anymore. And the reason I do that is because, look, if you're an artist, you should have your own voice. Stop worrying about what other people are doing. Stop trying to pit yourselves against their journey and whatever's happening for them. That's not yours. You can learn from each other. and You can help each other on the way. And you should. You should raise each other up because... That is what I love most about this industry is the collaboration part. When we start to figure this out, because I'm still trying to figure all of this out, you know, I think we're all just like, everybody is, nobody has the answer. We're all just trying. And to remember that everybody in the finite knowledge that we all have now and in the reactionary times that we have right now, and just trying to find the answers of where we all belong and what's happening to give each other a lot more grace to mess up. To, to make mistakes, to stumble beautifully. I just think if we can support each other in that, we're going to get to a solution a lot faster. You've had a lot to contend with, you know, fear of making that huge jump uh, to a, a lot of really tough situations like, you know, sexism, just tons of preconceived notions. And I'm sure the list goes on and on. And it seems like you really came out of all of that with a really good sense of self. Even with that said, and I think I'm going to make an assumption here, and you correct me. Sure, sure. I think the fear of disappointing your family probably weighed heaviest on you. You're right. Yeah. And this is why I'm so grateful to spaces like this podcast, because truly in, in the height of, of Kung Fu and, and doing you know these kind of talks, it made me really think about that. Because it's just something to unpack, right? You know? How's your family now, your dad, with your kicking ass <laughs> on a show? Seeing that you are happy and fulfilled and that you had the guts to go after something you really wanted. I have to say I underestimated them. Oh. You know what I mean? Like in, in that in that fear-based mindset that I just kept thinking the worst of their reactions. 
yeah, they had their questions when I first started this. I think another advantage to me starting a bit later is I was a grown ass woman doing it. So I got more autonomy over my decisions for that. But I underestimated their support and how much it would mean to them for me to find happiness in something outside of what they wanted. That's huge. Yeah. That's really beautiful. The lesson there for me too is that sometimes a lot of people are underestimated. We might think that they only have a certain way of thinking or a certain perspective, but it takes time. It takes time to unravel this stuff and to communicate and to connect with each other. And it took time for me to do that with my parents for them to understand me. I love that. So Yvonne, sign us off. Let me know who you are and what you represent. All right. Well, I'm Yvonne Chapman and I represent letting go of other people's expectations and ideas of the life that they think you should lead and instead trying for the one that you want. Thanks so much to Yvonne Chapman for her time, for hanging out and for sharing her experiences. Check her out on Kung Fu and follow this talented actress on social media. You know I'll have those links for you in the episode description. My next guest is a first responder, Dr. Chen Fu from New York City, who gives his firsthand account of what it was like being on the front lines, fighting to save lives during this pandemic. I remember holding the phone in front of certain patients, watching as their family members prayed over them in the final moments, saying goodbye, passing that phone over to loved ones, and just sort of thinking to myself, what could you possibly say or do in this moment? Hey everybody, my name's Dr. Chen Fu and I'm coming to Reppin. It's where we have conversations that create change. Reppin is available on all of your favorite podcast platforms and every episode is up for grabs. So download them on your devices and don't forget to subscribe, share and leave a review. And guys, I'm on Twitter. So talk to me at Reppin Podcast. Let me know your thoughts and check out some exclusive content called In Seconds, available only on our Instagram page at Reppin underscore podcast. To my crew, Nelson Pinero, my musical composer and technical director, thank you for all that you do. Always love and thanks to Gracie Kong. Reppin is a Suburban Outlaw Productions. Until next time, stand up and represent. Represent.